Uh, thank you for your warm welcome. It's always a great joy to be back at the cathedral. The ministry of this church played a very significant role in my uh, faith and in my uh, desire to head off into Christian ministry. Uh, I trust that you've got a Bible there. We're going to be spending some time in Acts 14 in this part of God's Word uh, this morning, so please do have that open in front of you. Uh, which dangerous idea has the greatest potential to change the world for the better? Uh, which dangerous idea has the greatest potential to change the world for the better? Uh, this was the question that was put to a Q&A panel in 2013 at what was called the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. Uh, the panellists responded in different ways. Jermaine Greer responded simply with the answer, freedom. Another member of the panel suggested abortion should be mandatory for 30 years to reduce the population. But when the host turned to Peter Hitchens, the brother of prominent atheist Christopher Hitchens, his response clearly startled the other panellists. He said this, the most dangerous idea in human history and philosophy remains the belief that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and rose from the dead. And that is the most dangerous idea you will ever encounter. Now, the host was a little taken aback and, and so followed up with the question, well, why dangerous? To which Hitchens responded, because it alters the whole of human behaviour and all our responsibilities. It turns the universe from a meaningless chaos into a designed place in which there is justice and there is hope and therefore we all have a duty to, to, to discover the nature of that justice and work towards that hope. It alters us all. If we reject it, it alters us all as well. It is incredibly dangerous. It's why so many people turn against it. As we turn to the book of Acts this morning, now what reaction do we find and ought to expect to the proclamation of the good news of the gospel? Let's pray as we come to God's word this morning. Gracious God, we thank you that you are a speaking God and that you speak to us clearly through your written word, the Bible, and the word become flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. By your spirit, please open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, our eyes to see, and please bend our wills that we might live lives that honour Christ. Amen. Uh, there's a monument that stands uh, near Circular Quay in Sydney on the corner of Hunter and Bly Streets, uh, passed by and unread by thousands daily. Uh, today, the monument is surrounded by sky-rise buildings, but back in 1788, uh, it was the place where a large tree stood under which was held the first Christian service in Australia. Uh, Richard Johnson was a man who had been appointed as chaplain to the colony, and he preached at that service on Psalm 116, and in particular, these verses... What should I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Now, this proclamation of the gospel was met with faith, yes, but opposition as well. Now, the governor of the time, Arthur Philip, he saw Johnson's role as merely uh, more of a, a policeman of morality. Uh, but Johnson knew that the gospel was far more powerful than spouting rules and regulations. Now, in, in Acts, as the gospel advances across Asia Minor, 17 centuries before it came to Australia, uh, we see the same response of faith and opposition. Uh, we start off in our passage in a place called Iconium, and as was their usual, usual custom, Paul and Barnabas, they go to the local synagogue and they preach the good news. The result? 
Verse 1, a great number of Jews and Greeks believe. Great. And verse 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Faith and opposition. And at this point, uh, we might expect to read, so Paul and Barnabas packed up and went home. But no, verse 3 tells us, so they remained for a long time. Why? To speak boldly for the Lord, who testified to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to be done through them. The proclamation of the word and the result, verse 4. But the residents of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, some sided with the apostles. Faith and opposition. I wonder whether you've found the same as you've spoken of Jesus to your friends. Eagerness among some, ridicule among others. Uh, There's a plan to stone Paul and Barnabas, uh, so they make tracks to the cities of Derby and Lystra, where they, verse 7, guess what? Continued proclaiming the good news. What? Paul and Barnabas know the response to their teaching, don't they? Some people want them dead. And yet they continue to spread the good news. Why? Why? Well, because they know that it's good news. And yes, they know to expect opposition, but they also know that it's only as people respond in faith and repentance to this good news that they're forgiven and they find lasting hope. In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas come across a man who cannot walk. He's been crippled from birth. Verse 9 tells us that Paul looked at the man intently And seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. Here we see the message of the apostles is being backed up by miraculous signs. It's accredited by these healings. Now, I wonder whether when you go shopping, you uh, look for the Australian-made logo. Uh, You know, the uh, the triangle with the kangaroo in the middle. Now, that logo shows you that the product is genuinely Australian-made. It's accredited. Now, these miraculous signs do the same thing for the apostles' message. They have the authority of Jesus And so, just as Luke, the writer of Acts, recorded in his gospel Jesus healing the crippled man, so too Luke records here in Acts Paul healing this crippled man. The authenticity of the gospel is backed up by this healing. The book of Acts It records a very unique period in history of God revealing his good news to the world. And so we may well ask, well, what are the signs and wonders that authenticate our message today? Well, surely it's the miracle of a changed heart, isn't it? It's the new life, the the, the changed life that the gospel brings. A life that isn't bent towards serving ourselves, but is now bent towards serving others. That's the miraculous sign that backs up, that authenticates the gospel. What's the result to this healing here in Acts 14? Well, this time, notice that it's not opposition initially, it's faith, very wrongly placed though, isn't it? The crowds believe that Paul and Barnabas are gods and so they worship them. Here we find 
the nature of the human heart. We are worshipping beings. We're made to worship. And yet we're, we're so prone to worship anyone or, or anything other than the one true and living God. And the reformer, John Calvin, described the heart as an idol factory. And Paul and Barnabas' response isn't to accept the praise, but to divert it to the one to whom it belongs. You see, these, these acts, these, these signs, aren't so much the acts of the apostles, they're the acts of the risen Lord Jesus. Notice Paul and Barnabas' response, we are mortals just like you. And as they respond to this praise, they articulate the good news that they're proclaiming. Now look with me from verse 15. Friends, why are you doing this? We are mortals just like you. And we bring you good news. That you should turn from these worthless things to the living God. Who made the heaven and the sea and the earth and all that is in them. In the past generations, he allowed all the nations to follow their own ways. Yet he has not left himself without a witness in doing good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. These are similar words to what Paul will share with the philosophers in just a few short chapters where he says, in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now Paul's telling us that, that the world around us shows us that there is a creator, and so therefore we are without an excuse. The good news of the gospel introduces us to who the one true and living God is, Jesus Christ. And to what he's done for us to rescue us. Here is the call of the gospel to the crowds in Derby and Lystra. <clears throat> you certainly cannot worship Paul and Barnabas. You cannot go on worshipping your gods and you certainly cannot add Jesus into the mix of the gods that you're already worshipping. It's the call of the gospel on us today. We cannot add Jesus into the mix of how we're already living our lives. If Jesus really is God, if, if his death really is a sin-bearing death, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it is Jesus and Jesus alone who deserves all our praise. The gospel calls me to turn away from living for whatever makes me feel good to living for what pleases Jesus. At the sound of the crowd's misplaced faith, uh, you'll notice, is soon overtaken by the sound of opposition in Acts 14, verse 19. Paul is stoned, dragged out of the city, and left for dead. <clears throat> he recovers, joins Barnabas, they move on to Derby, where, guess what? They proclaimed the good news to that city. Then they return to visit the believers in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Why? Because the proclamation of the word always needs to be followed up with discipleship, with Withdrawing alongside believers to, verse 22, strengthen and encourage them. And notice that Paul and Barnabas are honest with these new believers. Here is no healthy, wealthy and wise gospel. We must be realistic with new believers. No, their life may not be better when they put their trust in Jesus. In fact, in many ways, it may be worse from a human 
worldly perspective. Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch where they began and, and from where they were sent out and they report all that the Lord had done. And that's what we need for our walk with Jesus too, don't we? It's all too easy to live by sight and not by faith, to be concerned with what we can see right in front of us. To live by faith, we need the word preached to us that tells us of an unseen reality. And we need to hear news of what God is doing in his world so that we're encouraged to press on. That news like Gillian Law shares of the year of lockdown in Rome, of how, yes, there were restrictions in movement, but how more students attended the weekly prayer meeting online. Why? Well, because Rome's traffic is shocking. Or, or news of CMS worker Mary, uh, not a real name, in the Middle East, who shares of conversations with her friend. This friend asked Mary how Mary prays and, and she responded by sharing how through Jesus we can approach the one true and living God. Of how Jesus gives us his perfection so that we sinners can approach a holy God. To which Mary's friend responded, but that's unfair. Welcome to the gospel of grace. That God is beginning to open the door of faith with Mary's friend, as he did in Acts 14, 27. This is God's normal plan. He calls us to open our mouths as he opens the door of faith. But we've seen in Acts 14 just how dangerous an idea is the belief that Jesus rose from the dead, as Peter Hitchens put it. A dangerous for the person who proclaims the message, Paul and Barnabas' very life was in danger. And dangerous for the person who responds in faith, it radically alters their life. The danger remains today, both for the proclaimer and the believer. True in many parts of the world where Christians are persecuted. True for parts of the world where it's dangerous to be a CMS worker. A little later I'll share about a young family that you will partner with who are set heading to Central Asia. It's so dangerous, people might say. How can you take your family there? Others might object. But the good news of the gospel that Paul and Barnabas proclaimed and the good news of the gospel that we proclaim today is such that when it comes to meeting the one true and living God, the Christian, the person who trusts in Jesus, in dangerous Central Asia will always be eternally far, far safer than the person in safe Australia who doesn't trust in Christ. Our very lives are unlikely to be threatened for following Jesus in Australia but we can increasingly expect to be ridiculed and even to be seen as the bad guys as we continue to speak about Jesus and the need for people to respond to him. So we might ask, well, is it worth it? Uh, is it worth sticking our neck out for Jesus? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, because... It may well bring opposition, but that very same message that brings opposition is the same message that's needed for people to respond in faith, to find life, to be forgiven, and to have hope beyond the grave. 
So can I ask you, do you know this Jesus? Do you know this Jesus who turns the world from a meaningless chaos into a designed place where there is justice and where there is hope? And is this such good news that you're committed to seeing it reach your neighbours here in Armidale, your neighbours in Amsterdam, Azerbaijan and right around the world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gospel of grace. Thank you that your acceptance of us isn't dependent on what we've done, but it's a gift given to us because of all that you've done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that this is the message that's needed for our world to respond, to find hope. And so, Father, we pray that you would convict us of the truth of the gospel and give us boldness as we speak of Jesus to others so that this world might know Jesus and have lasting hope. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.